I'm Bill Hoffman, Communications, Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathology. I'm here with Dr. Tucker Levine. He is Professor of Laboratory Medicine and Pathology, a Senior Advisor for Research Operations, Office of Academic Clinical Affairs, and Director of the Office of Discovery and Translation in the University's Clinical and Translational Science Institute. Well, first of all, Bill, let me thank you for the invitation to come and share some of uh, some vignettes on my in my professional life in the department in the university. Uh, so I was born in Minneapolis, um, and at about age three, moved to Fargo, North Dakota, where my father uh, was had taken a position to practice pediatrics. He had trained at the at the university, and so I grew up uh, in Fargo, North Dakota. Um, about 250 miles north and west of here and uh, slightly cold. I attended college at North Dakota State University. Uh, and at the time I enrolled, uh, I, my uh, degree program was in zoology, which was kind of a program that would allow you to go in a number of different directions, although I didn't have much of appreciation for what those directions could be because the degree of uh, mentoring and uh, awareness that programs would provide to students was was pretty fun, was pretty basic. Uh, but as it turns out, uh, I took a course in my final quarter at North Dakota State in uh, microbiology from a woman named Mary Bromell, uh, long since deceased, who turned out to be an extraordinary influence on me, and really inspired me to consider uh, and go into graduate training. Uh, in, the, in the biomedical or biological sciences. And it turned out to be a fairly easy choice for me because first of all, I had watched my father practice pediatrics and seen the amount of time and energy he had to put into making house calls and taking house calls on weekends. And as a young guy, maybe with, uh, with not uh, the broadest perspective on life, I looked at that and thought, gee, I'm not sure this is what, to me, that was what medicine was. And, and maybe that wasn't the best choice for me. So I was really inspired by Mary Bromell and started to do a lot of reading about immunology on my own. And as it turns out, uh, my father would, uh, on rare occasions, see patients with uh, childhood acute lymphoblastic leukemia that he would refer to the University of Minnesota for care. And so some of the names that are now legendary at the university, uh, Robert Good, uh, Bill Cribbett, uh, Mark Nesbitt, were names that I first heard from my father as a consequence of his referral pattern. So that kind of uh, put things uh, in context. I came actually obsessed and fascinated with immunology and biomedical research. And I had a close friend of mine who went to the Nebraska Medical Center in Omaha. And so I chose to go there. Uh, I was fortunate to get uh, funding for the entire three years, which I would not have been able to get at the other one or two institutions I was exploring. So I went there and uh, pursued my PhD and uh, completed it in three years, and then came to the University of Minnesota as a postdoc. A very interesting and uh, I have to say life-changing moment occurred for me in 1975 when I had uh, uh, come, come back to Fargo from, uh, from Omaha to attend a meeting, a day and a half long meeting on microbiology that was being held there. And there was a speaker, and that speaker was John Kersey. He talked about leukemia and B and T lymphocytes, and um, as many of us know, uh, know, uh, know well, John had a very kind of down to earth, uh, very comfortable style about him. And I got, uh, I was, I was quite fascinated by this talk and the subject matter. At the end of the day, he uh, was sitting at a bar uh, with his host uh, before he was going back to the Twin Cities, and I walked past this bar, and in an, in, in, in an inflection point, which is even today retrospectively remarkable, I looked in and asked myself if I had the courage to go in and introduce myself and talk to him, and um, there was, uh, that was the old fork in the road. I could have kept on going, and my life would have been who knows what, but I chose to go in. Spent an hour talking to him, and at the end, he encouraged me to come to Minnesota when I was done with my PhD. So that's the that's how it really got started. Briefly, when I came here, uh, within about a year, I became uh, aware of the so-called monoclonal antibody technology, which had only been published by uh, George Kohler and Cesar Milstein uh, in late 1975. And John and I decided that this technology would be uh, uh, ideal for studying uh, cell surface molecules in childhood leukemia, et cetera. So 
I uh, took it upon myself to develop that technology here. I was the first one to make monoclonal antibodies at the university. Uh, after a lot of, uh, of um, failed experiments, believe me, it took me six to nine months to get the technology to work. Uh, but at the end of the day, we were very successful, made some of the first antibodies in the country, actually, and then subsequently used them to study the biology of the disease, used them in the setting of autologous bone marrow transplantation with John and Norma Ramsey and others. Um, and retrospectively, we were conducting translational clinical research before the phrase was uh, popularized. The dual, dual degree program, the combined MD-PhD program, for which uh, the university has a medical sinus training program award from the NIH, is I think by quite a bit the most complex and challenging educational program there is because it's an eight-year odyssey that students embark on where they obtain an MD and then are expected to conduct rigorous uh, PhD research in the subject area of their choice. And at the time in 2002, the program was uh, having some challenges with respect to uh, kind of the overall uh, sense of pride, uh, the commitment by the students, uh, the commitment by the faculty, et cetera. It just had a number of, uh, of uh, challenges, uh, which led to um, our uh, not renewing uh, the MSTP award from the NIH. So one thing led to another, and I was asked to, be, to take on the directorship. Um, and at the time, I had a, a leadership role in the Cancer Center as deputy director, so it was a bit, uh, uh, I had to think a little bit before I agreed, but I did. And it turned out to be a very rewarding experience because uh, to have a, even a high-level leadership role for a program that has the type of, or the degree of talent that these young students bring to the table when they embark on a dual degree is, uh, is a real responsibility and a source of great pride when they succeed. So I learned a lot about students, their values and their ambitions at the time and worked very hard with many other people here uh, particularly Pete Bitterman in the Department of Medicine, to really put this program back into uh, uh, a position of uh, rigor and strength, and I think, we, uh, I think we were successful. So with respect to the partnership, when I um, kind of uh, reinvented myself, if you will, in uh, uh, early 2010 and assumed a new position as Vice Dean for Research, in the medical school and associate vice president for research in the academic health center. One of the responsibilities with those dual positions was to be the, uh, the, uh, uh, the lead, um, the leader on the uh, University of Minnesota side for this partnership. So the very, very briefly, the history of this is about 16 years ago, um, the University of Mayo Clinic got together and, and uh, thought that, you know, in the area of research, maybe we should, uh, maybe we should do a little more work together here, spend a little more time thinking about what kind of problems we could tackle together. And the uh, state of Minnesota made an initial commitment uh, to this program, as did the University of Mayo, and there were many skeptics uh, with the belief that this would never work. And essentially, the program is a funding opportunity that requires uh, a lead faculty member from Mayo and a lead faculty member from the university to work on a problem in biomedical or healthcare research that neither could tackle alone. And now downstream of this program, some 15, 16 years later, is an incredible academic success story and commercialization success story, uh, whereby the state has now invested, I think, about $130 million into this program over the years. So I have a colleague uh, at Mayo, Eric Wieben, uh, who I work very closely with in, uh, in managing uh, this program and coordinating the, uh, the, uh, the funding specifics. One of the other things that I uh, embarked on early on under the uh, influence uh, of uh, my great friend Bruce Blazer was his Clinical and Translational Science Institute. So the CTSI was was uh, initiated, I think, in about 2008 uh, by Frank Serra, who felt very strongly that we needed to develop a stronger clinical research infrastructure to support clinical research in its in all of its uh, different uh, shapes and forms. And uh, at the time, when Bruce came to me, uh, we had submitted a revision of a grant application to the NIH uh, called, the, the, the terms are very similar, the CTSI is the acronym for the Institute at the University 
The CTSA is the acronym for the actual award from the NIH. So Bruce asked if I would take on the directorship of an entity that we had uh, designated the Office of Discovery and Translation. Uh, and I did so um, and wound up making a really important hire, uh, a woman named Sandra Wells, to come in and uh, direct this on a daily basis. And, and the bottom line, or I should say the, the outcome of this now some, some seven years later is that we've developed a program that really facilitates the translation of research from various states of success in the laboratory toward commercialization or clinical trial endpoints. And we've you know, developed uh, a, a, me a methodology that involves uh, project development teams which surround the principal investigator and, and provide the sort of input that a lot of faculty don't have a lot of knowledge about, regulatory issues, IRB, uh, uh, intellectual property, et cetera. And I think we've enjoyed considerable success and I have learned a tremendous amount about biomedical and healthcare research and how you move projects forward to impact human health that I never would have learned had I not gone down this pathway. Well, certainly in research, I ran my laboratory for 30 years. Uh, I've told many people that uh, over time that biomedical research is, in my opinion, one of the great success stories of uh, American society. It's, uh, I think that when you look at the fairly large number now, 40 billion that the federal government commits to the National Institutes of Health, Compared to a lot of other government programs, it's money that's extraordinarily well spent, and I think the bipartisanship that uh, Congress uh, has in the matter of uh, supporting NIH is, is testimony to that. So I think for most of us who've had long careers in biomedical research, it's the freedom of inquiry and the opportunity to pursue questions in areas that you happen to have an interest in, even independent of how that interest started. Uh, the f academic freedom is very real at this institution, and so for most of us, uh, I think that was the that was key. Uh, in the administration side, uh, ha when I look back at my decision nine or so years ago to take on these very senior administrative roles in research, I didn't know at the time uh, how much I would learn about how a university functions and how much I would begin to appreciate the talents that many administrative people bring to their jobs, which the average faculty member, quite frankly, and I was one of them, tends to kind of just dismiss that out of hand as being, well, you know, administration, it just gets in the way. But I've met some remarkable people with extraordinary talents, and it's been a privilege not only to work with them, but to just become more informed about how a complicated organization works. In lab medicine and pathology, where I've been since I came to the university and uh, met uh, Leo Furcht, for example, in 1978, his laboratory was right next to John Kersey's, so I got to know Leo quite well. Lab medicine and pathology to me is uh, characterized by the diversity of uh, faculty uh, activities and the breadth of uh, research and clinical problems that we have responsibility for. In what other department, I should say, would you have uh, very fundamental research being uh, conducted, for instance, immunology, neurodegenerative disease, cancer, et cetera, and we've got tremendous expertise in those areas and others. And on the other hand, you have uh, the clinical laboratory responsibilities and uh, uh, the remarkable identity we have nationally as a resource for supporting very large-scale clinical trials around the country, uh, the surgical pathology, anatomic pathology, with the expertise that they bring to the table, not only from the standpoint of research, but from the standpoint of care delivery. So it's, it's a remarkable mixture of backgrounds and perspectives, and I have always found it to be uh, really very personally, uh, it, very gratifying for me to have the privilege to be in an environment over these many years where you have th this much talent, this bandwidth, if you will, uh, that contributes to the mission of this institution. So uh, I, um, I, I'll thank everyone for, uh, for allowing me to do that.